Hey everyone, hope you all are doing well. Today we're going to be reading 2 Samuel 17, Nehemiah 3, and Ezekiel 40. Now let's pray before we get into the word. Hi Jesus, how are things up there? Things down here aren't too bad. Thank you so much for all the blessings that you've poured out on us that we don't deserve and allowing us to build this relationship with you every day. Please guide us with your Holy Spirit to open up our hearts and our minds to anything that you would have us to know in your word today. Please be with those who are dealing with any medical issues or poverty or who are brokenhearted, Lord. Just please place your hand on them and uh, uplift them. Please forgive us of our sins and lead us away from temptation, that we might be more like you and glorify you in your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now let's get started. Second Samuel 17 Ahithophel said to Absalom, I would choose twelve thousand men and set out tonight in pursuit of David. I would attack him while he is weary and weak. I would strike him with terror, and then all the people with him will flee. I would strike down only the king, and bring all the people back to you. The death of the man you seek will mean the return of all. All the people will be unharmed. This plan seemed good to Absalom and to all the elders of Israel. But Absalom said, Summon also Hushai the archite, so we can hear what he has to say as well. When Hushai came to him, Absalom said, Ahithophel has given this advice. Should we do what he says? If not, give us your opinion. Hushai replied to Absalom, The advice Ahithophel has given is not good this time. You know your father and his men. They are fighters and as fierce as a wild bear robbed of her cubs. Besides, your father is an experienced fighter. He will not spend the night with the troops. Even now he is hidden in a cave or some other place. If he should attack your troops first, whoever hears about it will say, There has been a slaughter among the troops who follow Absalom. Then even the bravest soldier, whose heart is like the heart of a lion, will melt with fear. For all Israel knows that your father is a fighter, and that those with him are brave. So I advise you, let all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, as numerous as a sand on the seashore, be gathered to you, with you yourself leading them into battle. Then we will attack him wherever he may be found, and we will fall on him as dew settles on the ground. Neither he nor any of his men will be left alive. If he withdraws into a city, then all Israel will bring ropes to that city, and we will drag it down to the valley until not so much as a pebble is left. Absalom and all the men of Israel said, The advice of Hushai the archite is better than that of Ahithophel. For the Lord had determined to frustrate the good advice of Ahithophel in order to bring disaster on Absalom. Hushai told Zadok and Abiathar the priests, Ahithophel has advised Absalom and the elders of Israel to do such and such, but I have advised them to do so and so. Now send a message at once and tell David, Do not spend the night at the fords in the wilderness. Cross over without fail, or the king and all the people with him will be swallowed up. Jonathan and Ahimez were staying at Enrogel. A female servant was to go and inform them, and they were to go and tell King David, for they could not risk being seen entering the city. But a young man saw them and told Absalom. So the two of them left at once and went to the house of a man in Bahurim. He had a well in his courtyard, and they climbed down into it. His wife took a covering and spread it out over the opening of the well and scattered grain over it. No one knew anything about it. When Absalom's men came to the woman at the house, they asked, Where are Ahimez and Jonathan? The woman answered them. They crossed over the brook. The men searched but found no one, so they returned to Jerusalem. After they had gone, the two climbed out of the well and went to inform King David. They said to him, Set out and cross the river at once. Ahithophel has advised such and such against you. So David and all the people with him set out and crossed the Jordan. By daybreak, no one was left who had not crossed the Jordan. When Ahithophel saw that his advice had not been followed, 
he saddled his donkey and set out for his house in his hometown. He put his house in order and then hanged himself. So he died and was buried in his father's tomb. David went to Mahanaim, and Absalom crossed the Jordan with all the men of Israel. Absalom had appointed Amasa over the army in place of Joab. Amasa was the son of Jether, an Ishmaelite who had married Abigail, the daughter of Nahash, and sister of Zeruiah, the mother of Joab. The Israelites and Absalom camped in the land of Gilead. When David came to Mahanaim, Shobi, son of Nahash, from Rabbah of the Ammonites, and Makir, son of Amiel, from Lodibar, and Barzillai, the Gileadite, from Rogalim, brought bedding and bowls and articles of pottery. They also brought wheat and barley, flour and roasted grain, beans and lentils, honey and curds, sheep and cheese from cow's milk for David and his people to eat. For they said, The people have become exhausted and hungry and thirsty in the wilderness. Nehemiah 3 Eliashib the high priest and his fellow priests went to work and rebuilt the sheep gate. They dedicated it and set its doors in place, building as far as the Tower of the Hundred, which they dedicated, and as far as the Tower of Hananel. The men of Jericho built the adjoining section, and Zakur, son of Imri, built next to them. The fish gate was rebuilt by the sons of Hassaneh. They laid its beams and put its doors and bolts and bars in place. Merimoth, son of Uriah, the son of Hakaz, repaired the next section. Next to him, Meshulam, son of Barakiah, the son of Meshezabel, made repairs, and next to him, Zadok, son of Bena, also made repairs. The next section was repaired by the men of Tekoa, but their nobles would not put their shoulders to the work under their supervisors. The Jeshana gate was repaired by Joyada, son of Pesia, and Meshulam, son of Besodiah. They laid its beams and put its doors with their bolts and bars in place. Next to them, repairs were made by men from Gibeon and Mizpah, Melatiah of Gibeon and Jadon of Maranath, places under the authority of the governor of Trans-Euphrates. Uziel, son of Harhiah, one of the goldsmiths, repaired the next section, and Hananiah, one of the perfume makers, made repairs next to that. They restored Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. Raphiah, son of Hur, ruler of a half-district of Jerusalem, repaired the next section. Adjoining this, Jediah, son of Heromoth, made repairs opposite his house, and Hattush, son of Hashabnia, made repairs next to him. Malkijah, son of Harim, and Hasub, son of Pahath Moab, repaired another section and the tower of the ovens. Shalom, son of Halohesh, ruler of a half-district of Jerusalem, repaired the next section with the help of his daughters. The valley gate was repaired by Hanan and the residents of Zenoah. They rebuilt it and put its doors with their bolts and bars in place. They also repaired a thousand cubits of the wall as far as the dung gate. The dung gate was repaired by Malkijah, son of Rechab, ruler of the district of Beth Hakarim. He rebuilt it and put its doors with their bolts and bars in place. The fountain gate was repaired by Shalon, son of Kol Hose, ruler of the district of Mizpah. He rebuilt it, roofing it over and putting its doors and bolts and bars in place. He also repaired the wall of the pool of Siloam by the king's garden, as far as the steps going down from the city of David. Beyond him, Nehemiah, son of Azbuk, ruler of a half-district of beth Zur, made repairs up to a point opposite the tombs of David, as far as the artificial pool and the house of the heroes. Next to him, the repairs were made by the Levites under Reham, son of Bani. Beside him, Hashabiah, ruler of half the district of Kaila, carried out repairs for his district. Next to him, the repairs were made 
by their fellow Levites under Binu, son of Henadad, ruler of the other half-district of Kilah. Next to him, Ezer, son of Jeshua, ruler of Mizpah, repaired another section from a point facing the ascent to the armory as far as the angle of the wall. Next to him, Baruch, son of Zabai, zealously repaired another section from the angle to the entrance of the house of Eliashib the high priest. Next to him, Merimoth, son of Uriah, the son of Hakaz, repaired another section from the entrance of Eliashib's house to the end of it. The repairs next to him were made by the priests from the surrounding region. Beyond them, Benjamin and Hasub made repairs in front of their house, and next to them, Azariah, son of Messiah, the son of Ananiah, made repairs beside his house. Next to him, Binu, son of Henadad, repaired another section from Azariah's house to the angle and the corner, and Palal, son of Uzai, worked opposite the angle and the tower projecting from the upper palace near the court of the guard. Next to him, Pediah, son of Parash, and the temple servants living on the hill of Ophel made repairs up to a point opposite the water gate toward the east and the projecting tower. Next to them, the men of Tekoa repaired another section from the great projecting tower to the wall of Ophel. Above the horse gate, the priests made repairs, each in front of his own house. Next to them, Zadok, son of Immer, made repairs opposite his house. Next to him, Shemaiah, son of Chekaniah, the guard at the east gate, made repairs. Next to him, Hananiah, son of Shelemiah, and Hanan, the sixth son of Zalaf, repaired another section. Next to them, Meshulam, son of Barakiah, made repairs opposite his living quarters. Next to him, Malkijah, one of the goldsmiths, made repairs as far as the house of the temple, servants, and the merchants opposite the inspection gate, and as far as the room above the corner. And between the room above the corner and the sheep gate, the goldsmiths and merchants made repairs. Ezekiel 40 In the twenty-fifth year of our exile, at the beginning of the year, on the tenth of the month, in the fourteenth year, after the fall of the city, on that very day the hand of the Lord was on me, and he took me there. In visions of God he took me to the land of Israel, and set me on a very high mountain, on whose south side were some buildings that looked like a city. He took me there, and I saw a man whose appearance was like bronze. He was standing in the gateway with a linen cord and a measuring rod in his hand. The man said to me, Son of man, look carefully and listen closely, and pay attention to everything I am going to show you, for that is why you have been brought here. Tell the people of Israel everything you see. The East Gate to the Outer Wall I saw a wall completely surrounding the temple area. The length of the measuring rod in the man's hand was six long cubits each of which was a cubit and a handbreadth. He measured the wall. It was one measuring rod thick and one rod high. Then he went to the east gate. He climbed its steps and measured the threshold of the gate. It was one rod deep. The alcoves for the guards were one rod long and one rod wide, and the projecting walls between the alcoves were five cubits thick. And the threshold of the gate next to the portico facing the temple was one rod deep. Then he measured the portico of the gateway. It was eight cubits deep, and its jams were two cubits thick. The portico of the gateway faced the temple. Inside the east gate were three alcoves on each side. The three had the same measurements, and the faces of the projecting walls on each side had the same measurements. Then he measured the width of the entrance of the gateway. It was ten cubits high, and its length was thirteen cubits. In front of each alcove was a wall one cubit high, and the alcoves were six cubits square. Then he measured the gateway from the top of the rear wall of one alcove to the top of the opposite one. The distance was twenty-five cubits 
from one parapet opening to the opposite one. He measured along the faces of the projecting walls all around the inside of the gateway, 60 cubits. The measurement was up to the portico facing the courtyard. The distance from the entrance of the gateway to the far end of its portico was 50 cubits. The alcoves and the projecting walls inside the gateway were surmounted by narrow parapet openings all around, as was the portico. The openings all around faced inward. The faces of the projecting walls were decorated with palm trees. The Outer Court Then he brought me into the outer court. There I saw some rooms and a pavement that had been constructed all around the court. There were thirty rooms along the pavement. It abutted the sides of the gateways and was as wide as they were long. This was the lower pavement. Then he measured the distance from the inside of the lower gateway to the outside of the inner court. It was a hundred cubits on the east side as well as on the north. The North Gate Then he measured the length and width of the north gate, leading into the outer court. Its alcoves, three on each side, its projecting walls and its portico had the same measurements as those of the first gateway. It was 50 cubits long and 25 cubits wide. Its openings, its portico, and its palm tree decorations had the same measurements as those of the gate facing east. Seven steps led up to it and its portico opposite them. There was a gate to the inner court facing the north gate, just as there was on the east. He measured from one gate to the opposite one. It was a hundred cubits. The South Gate Then he led me to the south side, and I saw the south gate. He measured its jams and its portico, and they had the same measurements as the others. The gateway and its portico had narrow openings all around, like the openings of the others. It was fifty cubits long and twenty-five cubits wide. Seven steps led up to it, with its portico opposite them. It had palm tree decorations on the faces of the projecting walls on each side. The inner court also had a gate facing south, and he measured from this gate to the outer gate on the south side. It was a hundred cubits. The Gates to the Inner Court Then he brought me into the inner court through the south gate, and he measured the south gate. It had the same measurements as the others. Its alcoves, its projecting walls, and its portico had the same measurements as the others. The gateway and its portico had openings all around. It was 50 cubits long and 25 cubits wide. The porticos of the gateways around the inner court were 25 cubits wide and 5 cubits deep. Its portico faced the outer court. Palm trees decorated its jams and eight steps led up to it. Then he brought me to the inner court on the east side, and he measured the gateway. It had the same measurements as the others. Its alcoves, its projecting walls, and its portico had the same measurements as the others. The gateway and its portico had openings all around. It was 50 cubits long and 25 cubits wide. Its portico faced the outer court. Palm trees decorated the jams on either side, and eight steps led up to it. Then he brought me to the north gate and measured it. It had the same measurements as the others, as did its alcoves, its projecting walls, and its portico, and it had openings all around. It was 50 cubits long and 25 cubits wide. Its portico faced the outer court. Palm trees decorated the jams on either side and eight steps led up to it. The Rooms for Preparing Sacrifices a room with a doorway was by the portico in each of the inner gateways, where the burnt offerings were washed. In the portico of the gateway were two tables on each side, on which the burnt offerings, sin offerings, and guilt offerings were slaughtered. By the outside wall of the portico of the gateway, near the steps at the entrance of the north gateway were two tables, and on the other side of the steps were two tables. So there were four tables on one side of the gateway, and four on the other, eight tables in all, 
on which the sacrifices were slaughtered. There were also four tables of dressed stone for the burnt offerings, each a cubit and a half long, a cubit and a half wide, and a cubit high. On them were placed the utensils for slaughtering the burnt offerings and the other sacrifices. And double-pronged hooks, each a handbreadth long, were attached to the wall all around. The tables were for the flesh of the offerings. The Rooms for the Priests Outside the inner gate, within the inner court, were two rooms. One at the side of the north gate and facing south, and another at the side of the south gate and facing north. He said to me, The room facing south is for the priests who guard the temple, and the room facing north is for the priests who guard the altar. These are the sons of Zadok, who are the only Levites who may draw near to the Lord to minister before him. Then he measured the court. It was square, a hundred cubits long and a hundred cubits wide, and the altar was in front of the temple. He brought me to the portico of the temple and measured the jams of the portico. They were five cubits wide on either side. The width of the entrance was fourteen cubits, and its projecting walls were three cubits wide on either side. The portico was twenty cubits wide and twelve cubits from front to back. It was reached by a flight of stairs, and there were pillars on each side of the jams. Thanks for joining and listening today. If you have any questions, leave them down here in the comments section, and I'll be making some videos where I go through some of those questions, show you some of the questions that I had, and maybe we can find some answers or even dive into it together. Thanks, guys. Hit the like and subscribe, and come back for more. All right, guys. Take it easy. Bye. God bless.